Welcome to Becoming Church, the podcast where we discuss how the message and movement of Jesus is not just about becoming Christians, but about becoming the church. I'm your host, Kristen Mockler Young. And before we jump into my conversation today, I want to remind you that we are celebrating 10,000 downloads of this podcast with a prize for you. For one more week, everyone who leaves a review of Becoming Church on Apple Podcasts is entered to win. Even if you don't listen on Apple, that's where your review has to live. So scroll on down and use the link below. After you leave a review, email me a screenshot of your review or your reviewer name so I know which one belongs to you and you will be entered to win. Now I'm excited to introduce you to my girl, Alexandra Hoover. Alex is fully herself and I love the way she embraces every aspect of who she is which you will hear woven through this conversation, even as she walks us through her own grief and church hurt to help us find God in our own. I'll link up all the books and courses she mentions in the show notes below, and I'll meet you back here after the interview. I am here with my friend, Alexandra Hoover. Welcome to the show, friend. Hi, it's so good to see you. I'm so distracted by your lashes. <laughs> I can't even focus. This is, it was a very, very fast, no, granted, like three coats of mascara, but a very, very fast application. I think we should have a whole episode just on the lash, like mascara. <laughs> what, you're, what are you using? I mean, I have a serum. Listen, if we really want to get into it, we'll get the listeners in immediately. Yeah, I am having so- all kinds of hormonal issues. But one of the bonuses was my doctor was like, well, I guess you need a prescription for like Latisse for eyelash <gasps> serum. So I was like, well, sign me up for that. Thank you so send, much. Send some down to <laughs> Charleston, my girl. Wow. Yeah, I'll text it to you. I'll text it to you so you can see. <laughs> I love that we are just jumping right in here with... All of the girly things. So I'm going to lean fully into it. At the time of recording, yeah, you have just cut off yeah. your hair. Like this is how we say it in the South, right? You just chopped off your hair. I literally chopped off like 10 inches of my hair. Literally. I love it. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. I know. Well, and you probably haven't adjusted yet. It was just like yesterday. It was literally, yeah, it was I, so I, it was Tuesday morning or two, was it Tuesday? It was Monday, Monday at one o'clock. Monday, one o'clock. It took like two and a half hours, a big chop. And I have not adjusted. I did wake up like frantic yesterday. I went to the bathroom (laughs) and like caught myself like like by the side of my like, of my, of my view and did not know who that was. And I was like, oh my God, that's me. And that's my hair. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yes. Like side, so side profile jump scare. Totally. I get it. I get it. I have done major haircuts where I've donated and cut off like 10 to 12 inches. Yeah. Listen, maybe for somebody listening, if you're like, I can't believe they're starting talking about mascara and haircuts. Here's it's important. The deal. Number one. Number one. Maybe, maybe you have a beard. Maybe you've done, I think a lot of guys do this. Like they grow a beard, they shave a beard, the facial hair, maybe that's their thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But also I'm so done with hiding my femininity. So we're just going to talk about all of the ways that God made us and all of the things. Absolutely. So yeah, there's no shame. (laughs) There's no shame. I really think that a lot of times, and tell me if this is true for you, because I'm just making a hypothesis here. Yeah. And what we're going to talk about and then seeing the haircut, I was like, this is more than a haircut. This was like a letting go of, of things for you. Oh my gosh. This was so spiritual. I mean, I think I, the, before the haircut came like the, the caption, that's the most millennial thing I could ever say, but like, I knew, <laughs> I knew what I was going to tell the world. And it was that I've let go uh, and really I've cut off so much physical and spiritual weight the last year mm-hmm. and a half of my life yeah. that this just felt like the right next thing to do. Like it felt like this made sense to go next. Yeah. And I have not had short hair since I got married. And that was almost 16 years ago since I met Mario, got married. Yeah. So it's been a hot minute and cutting off my hair is, was absolutely spiritual. I mean, like borderline euphoric experience in the chair. I'm like, am I having a panic attack? Am I seeing God? Uh I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I'm actually not sure what my body is hot. Is that you, Lord? Wow. What's happening? I don't know. (laughs) Yes. Well, we're going to get into it. You know, you, you have had to 
let go of a lot yeah. over the past couple of years. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was even just looking through like some of our texts and voice yeah. memos over the last couple of years and things. And I'm like, man, Alex has walked a lot of things. And so I did, we'll just go ahead and say this too. I yeah. introduced you as Alexandra. Yes. But I'm now probably going to call you Alex I know. for it's most we're of the interview. That's okay. It is. Yes. <laughs> Or it might be a Hoover. It might be a whatever. Yes, like, yes all of it. Respond to any of them. I will. Um, so you, yeah, you've had to walk through a lot of things. And I want to know not just hmm. what happened, but also how God met you in these different experiences. Yeah. And so I think, unless I'm overlooking something, I think I wanted to talk about and start with when you wrote Eyes Up. Hmm. Um, I actually have it right Aww, here. Friends. This little Yay. beauty. So this is a book that you wrote about how to trust God's heart. And yeah. so will you share a little bit about what experiences kind of led you even to writing this, the stories that are here? Yeah. So most of my, I didn't grow up in the church. I think that's something super important to start off with. I didn't mm-hmm. grow up with a tidy life. I did not know God. I always like to say that I, that I had proximity to God in way of like knowledge and awareness. So I would say yeah. I was agnostic plus. Like not okay. totally, <laughs> not, not totally an atheist, but agnostic plus, like I knew there was a God, uh, just, I had such doubt about the character, his kindness. I, I low key thought he was just like a narcissist, kind of crazy. And, okay. oh, totally. And I, I just like want to worship totally, him. And- totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Like if there is a God and all he wants, like he's created us to live in this like dark and, and, and like, you know, gloomy world full of doom. And you, you only did it so that we could worship you. I'm like, yeah, you're a narcissist. Like, why would I ever okay. want to worship you? So that was like my entire framework. And to be even more raw and honest, that up until like, I don't know, maybe seven years ago, that was sort of still a thorn in my side. Like, why would you do this? Like I, most of my faith, which is going to lead up to eyes up. Most of my faith has been a faith full of doubt and I, t- I, whenever I get the opportunity to preach or teach, I, I start with like the, the greatest gift I've ever had is the amount of doubt I've had to wrestle through mm. because I have found myself really, really resolving why it is that I love Jesus and why it is that I follow Jesus and why it is that I keep going back to the church and why does it, I keep yeah. showing up and writing and teaching. It's not because it's fun or because I've not been hurt in it or because, <laughs> or because I'm easily accepted by people. If anything, I'm such a mixed bag for people that they don't even know what to do with me whenever I show up in spaces Mm. because I'm so, I don't fit into one particular mold as much as people would love to like box me in. And I live for that. Like I'm a Hispanic 34 year old, I'm Latina. I didn't grow up in the church. I'm feisty. I, people don't understand like where I, where I fall in line theologically. Everything feels like super ambiguous for people. And I love to see it. I'm like, let's talk about it. I love to create room for conversation. (laughs) So eyes up, eyes up came from a place of learning to reconcile really, really hard things to a really, really good God. And the journey that it took me down was learning to trust his heart when I couldn't trace his hand, learning to trust his Mm. character, learning to trust his faithfulness. And for a lot of us who have endured a lot of suffering and pain, that is really the crux of, of our whole lives, right? Is like, how do we how do we find contentment and joy with God in the midst of suffering? And yeah. how do we move forward if we can't reconcile the past? And so mm-hmm. Eyes Up is all is all about that and helping people walk through their journeys, forward in their journeys with confidence to keep their eyes up on God and not their circumstance. Yeah, that's so good. I love actually that the conversation is turning a little bit more toward doubt and letting people wrestle and letting people have questions. And so thank you for your voice in entering this conversation. Um, I actually saw something on Instagram just this morning and it was basically, yeah, this idea of like, we have to create churches where people are allowed to ask questions because I thought if people are, this is what's actually happening. And I don't understand how the church doesn't seem to get this. People are coming in with questions and with doubts asking, wanting to know more about God, yeah, wanting to know more. And the best that we can give them is either like a Mm non-answer or a non-answer with a bit of side eye and shame that how come they didn't know this already, or they didn't have faith already. And I'm like, Hmm. what? Yeah. (laughs) People are asking for us to show them who God is. And our, our answer is just like, if you are better than you would know, like, yeah. what are we doing? 
Yeah, I ha- I feel like you should have me back for just a different episode <laughs> on <laughs> on all of that. I do. I mean, I think one of the when we see Jesus, when we're looking at the life of Jesus and the way that he had conversation, I like to think of it like this: like the way of Jesus, the life of Jesus was is our blueprint. Like it is our roadmap to be to to be what I like to call like humanologists. Like we we get to people with people. And the best way to do that is to look at the way of Jesus and how he did it. I do not see Jesus not allowing people to wrestle and have contentions with the realities of their life. I mean, imagine this, picture this, you've, you, you spend your whole life hearing about the Messiah. You finally meet the Messiah. He tells you, I am the Messiah. He asks you to leave everything you've ever known. You literally leave it. Things Uh catch on fire. They're not going the way you thought they would right? You're in the middle of suffering. You don't have what you need. You're lacking provision. You're confused. In my flesh, Alexander Hoover would say, Lord, you for sure have forsaken me. Right. And then, yeah. And there's a teaching moment where Jesus consistently reframes. Now, what's even more beautiful is that it shows us all throughout the scripture in the life of Jesus, it shows us that there is a turning point where Jesus says to us like, Hey, you've seen me, but there's there's intimacy that comes with that and us approaching somebody who's just coming in full of doubt and saying, you must have intimacy with God is like me telling my eight-year-old child to go ahead and start doing algebra. Like, it's just, you have to walk with them to yeah, that's good. intimacy and to grace with God. If they don't have enough proximity to God, there's nothing that we can say in our human and our flesh and our humanity to make them see how much grace and how much good there is in God. They're not going to trust him. So it takes time and we're not the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, and without doubt, the whole idea of faith is that it's a choice, right? Faith is trust. It's belief. It's choosing. And so if there is no doubt, and I probably have to be careful with this next statement here, because <laughs> mm-hmm. my brain is like, without doubt, you can't have faith. I'm not sure that that's true, but I don't know if you can have a strong faith. I would say, yeah. If I, you're just blindly believing. Totally. Yeah. You know, I would say that faith, I mean, the, the word faith in, in Hebrew or in, yeah, in Greek is pistis and it's, it's more of an action verb than anything. And it's really, yeah. faith is really the belief in the uncreated creator. So it's our choice to believe in God and it's, it, there isn't like our doubt helps us to believe more because it helps us walk through seasons where we'll have to choose to believe in God. Like it's a muscle right. that we're working out. Yeah, I think definitely. sometimes faith is is super, I think it's, it's miss, it's mistaught. And I think a lot of people spend their whole lives trying to let like grow their faith instead of just walk out their faith in their belief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's, I think there's a, you know, there's the whole, I should know I am not, I'd be the first one to tell you that I am the pastor who does not have Bible verses memorized, but I know the one about the the milk and the solid food, right? And that's what it makes that's me think right. of. It's like, we just, people, I think a lot of times go, I have faith and I believe, and I believe that they do, Yeah. but it's just because someone told them this is the thing. And they're like, okay, but there's so, it's so much different. We can have such mm-hmm. a deeper, more complex relationship with God when we have had to struggle and wrestle and yeah. choose it again and again for ourselves. Totally. So after you wrote Eyes Up, um, it was all happy and yay and Ooh, launch party and we were doing so it and cute. we were doing the whole thing. And then something really tragic happened. Yeah. So what's what's so interesting about this is that I I hate that it's a part of my story. And this is so much of yeah. my like, this is my my whole life brand is me being mad about the story that I get to tell. Yeah. Because I just wish it were different. So my, a week before my book came out, maybe not even a week, a few days before my book came out, I was at the local Target in South Charlotte. And uh, I just remember like trying, trying to bargain with God and ask him to please, because I knew he could, right? Like asking him to please protect my family from any type of like catastrophe or disaster or tragedy for just one week. I'm like, if you could Mm -hmm. just for one week, like, hold, you know, just pull it back, hold off, talk to who you need to talk right. to, to make this go right. down for me. And that, and I would be so grateful. I verbatim remember saying that to the Lord, like, God, just please give me a week. Let me launch my first book into the world with like success. Yeah. Well, two days before my book came out and it was like on a great trajectory and we were really excited. My brother 
um, Levy passed away totally unexpectedly. Like we did not see it coming May 22nd. And I just remember, remember my cousin calling me Simon and me getting like physically sick over lunch. Like I was at lunch with my friend, Larisha and Mario and like physically got sick, got up, started literally throwing up, could not handle like full, full body visceral reaction to it. And my immediate response was like, Oh, you, you, like I asked you to keep this from me. I asked you to, to, to give me one week where I didn't have to experience any tragedy and literally one of the worst things that could have happened happened. Yeah. And I remember being in a world of, I wouldn't say I was angry. I was not angry at God. I think like five years before that, I would have been angry at the Lord. I was just so sad and Mm. confused and really disappointed. I think I've wrestled with this a lot. I was disappointed because ultimately I understood and had gotten, and I wrote a whole book about this. I wrote a whole book about believing and trusting God's plan. I wrote a whole book about believing in the character of God and why he does things or why he allows things. And I remember just being disappointed and and having to grapple with the reality that things may not always go the way I want them to. And I actually don't get to control that. Yeah. And it was absolutely devastating. I mean, I, all of 2022 was just kind of kind of a whirlwind after that and just trying to piece back together my whole life in the midst of that, just walking through figuring out how to show up on the internet, how to write, how to, how to be right. a local church girl and, and lead as a woman. I mean, I was like right. inundated with just about every insecurity that I could that year. But it, although it was one of the hardest years, I feel like it was the year that broke me in the best kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised to hear that you say that you weren't angry with, I feel like that would have been my first I'm an, I think I'd go to anger before yeah. I go to any anything else. Do you think you felt betrayed? I feel like I would have felt betrayed by God. Yeah. I to, mean, to say, Hey, I'm asking you for this one specific thing. Yeah. And then for that, not to ha- like, I don't know. I don't know if I would have come through it as well hmm. or as quickly as you did. I just, let me say this. I it feels super rude. No, I hear it is rude. I let me, <laughs> let me say this, right? Like the only reason I don't think I responded out of anger towards God is because this isn't my first ro- rodeo of like deep suffering. Mm. So like I, and I mean, there, I, there are a lot of difficult things and for the sake of like trigger warnings and not going into two, things that are too graphic, like I walked yeah. through really painful experiences And I spent most of my early years in my faith angry at God, like straight up angry. Like my, my, my husband jokes and actually wrote this down in my notes a few days ago. I think I'm going to write a devotional one day named or titled the day that I cussed out God and how it was the best thing for my faith. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) Because truly I remember like actually sitting in my car with my husband Mario and just going off and quite literally cussing out God and being like, you're just not, I knew it. Like I knew that you weren't, I knew that you were real, but I knew that you were, you were a narcissist. Like you don't actually love me or my family. And this is before my brother passed away. So all that to say, I think that I writing eyes up helped me understand the righteousness of God and also what it means for God to be father and what it means for God to actually have his hand over everything. So understanding both sides of God, where he allows certain, certain things to happen. And in the same breath where he brings insane reconciliation and redemption for his people, he wouldn't be God if he didn't do both. And yeah. that's why Jesus dies for our sin. So I think that there's, if you read Isaac, if you're listening, Isaac will help you. Yeah. reconcile and move past the initial response being anger. I think we can be angry. I, I'm angry all the time. I, my first response is always anger too, but I wasn't angry at God because I knew, I knew that although he had seen this in his foreknowledge, his heart was just as broken for mine that it had happened. Like God's not, a, he, mm. he's not like playing puppet with us. I think that's another yeah. thing you've got to like, know. Yeah. God's not like in heaven pulling puppet strings with our lives. Like that's, that is not a loving father. And so it it always, for me has gone back to like, what do I actually know to be true about God? 
Mm -hmm. And that has helped me reorient my, my flesh and know that he's not out here playing Russian roulette with our lives. He's not right. So, yeah, I think a different way to look at it too is going, God knew what was going to happen. God knew what was going to happen with your brother. And so because of that, he aligned the right timing, your ideas, the book deal, whatever. So that, yeah when that happened, you had already just spent a season working through, you know, he, in a way you can look at, like he was preparing you for that. He knew what you would need to have in your mind and your heart in order to walk through it. Which I even hate uh, that idea. Like I rebel against that idea, but it's, but it's so true. And it's out of his love and compassion for us. Like I, I'm so careful with that kind of language of, of because I don't want to, to ever lead anyone to think that God's out here, like putting us through boot camp for life. Sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. But it is so true that there is like, there is a kindness to God where he does allow things to happen in his foreknowledge and, and he turns them for our good. Like he, he actually does. So I, I, yeah, I hope that whoever's listening can hear that for sure. Yeah. Was there anything in particular either in writing eyes up or researching or just in life that, that is kind of your Ebenezer stone or your Mm. thing that you go back to, like anytime disappointment happens, is there like one thing that kind of keeps you rooted? Yeah. Um, you know, I would say that the way that I met Jesus was so kind of unconventional Okay. That it helps me remember that the kingdom of God is so much bigger than what I actually know it to be. So I, I'll, and I'll make this quick. My mom struggles with, with like se- severe depression and some, just some chronic like mental health things and to like protect her story. That's all I'll share on that. But when I was sure. 18, I, it was just, it was just my mom and I in Charlotte and we didn't have insurance. She just got a divorce and we were so broke. And I needed to help her and she, she needed to find, we need to find a clinic that could offer some sort of support. Long story short, I found a church in North Charlotte that, um, or I found a clinic, I should say in North Charlotte, that was a mental health clinic for, uh, the community and they were bilingual. I'm like, great. They'll offer services. I'll take her up there. did not know it was connected to a church. I wasn't, okay. I wasn't a believer. I didn't follow Jesus at that time and neither did she. Um, I would say, okay. we were, I would say she was like spiritual ish. So okay. like she knew about God and like had known, we, she grew up Catholic, but kind of like went away from the faith and she just was, she had her ups and downs and I was in proximity to that. So like I knew enough. Right. So sure. we, we got to this clinic and found out it was connected to a church and I was, I didn't care what, I mean, it could have been, it could have been anything. I was like, great. If you can help her, I'm down. Help. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, where my mom received physical healing is where I received spiritual healing and where I met Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so this very unconventional road and, and kind of these winding roads I've been down, that's been my whole life. And that for, for me is like a reminder that God is actually working things out. And it really literally does feel like a roller coaster most of the time but it, but he's real and it's all good. And it's all true. Yeah. No, I love that. Well, after you wrote eyes up, lost your brother. Yeah. Then I think a lot of things were happening maybe behind the scenes. No, nothing, nothing at all. Uh, (laughs) No, nothing. (laughs) Nothing nothing at all. Everything was great. Relaxing. So you, you have mentioned Charlotte and Charleston. And so you, what a segue, you're our pod, look at you, you're a podcaster, incredible podcaster. Wow. (laughs) But you did in the last, when did you move? Yeah. So we've been been in Charleston six and a half months. So we moved July 31st was our first day in Charleston. Okay. Feels like, so yeah, but it wasn't just a move for you. It was a move. It was a a career change. It was a job. Like, yeah, it was a, Share as much as you want or as much as you can. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So what was God doing there? Yeah. So I have been in vocational ministry, like paid vocational ministry for 11 years. And I was at the same church for 10 out of those 11 years, which is kind of insane. And it was not the first church that I worked at. It was the church work church for, uh, it was the first church that I was paid at. So that's important to know too. So Mario and I served at different churches a few years before. We just weren't paid. We were like the the teen directors and he, and 
you know, doing the things for free in Jesus name. So first, sure. <laughs> first paid job at a church. And I, I will, I will, let me give this caveat too. So I have, I think I have spent the last six months in, in, in like the hidden space with the Lord sort of in this area, because I, I've not known how to show up well and lead well from a place of, of wholeness and a place of humility. So I, I worked at a mega church in Charlotte, loved what God did there for my family. It was some of, some of the best and some of the worst years of my life. Mm. And I, feel really good saying that. I think I, I wrestled with knowing how to even say that in the name of like wanting to protect, um, the, the wholeness of the bride. And I want people to know Jesus and to know the church because she is so beautiful Yeah, that I think I've kept to myself for a really long time, all of the hardship that I've endured, but that's not been helpful either. Right. And so naturally my personality is not, (laughs) I'm not, I'm not typically scared or afraid of conflict. Um, but the Lord has tempered me in the best kind of way. So the last few years, I would say that we went, I went through personally and my family and Mario did too. We went through several relationship implosions, um, at our, at our old church and, um, conflict, leadership conflict. And I, I feel like, and I, I don't say this flippantly. I feel like I came out the best leader that I could have. I mean, I came out the best leader that I could have. I came out the best Bible teacher that I could have. I came out the best wife, the best friend. I feel like I came out like a ninja for Jesus, like straight up. I'm like, oh, I've seen that before. I know what unhealth looks like. I know, I know how I, I know my own unhealth in this particular year. I know how I might have fed into that toxic, toxicity, right. Or, or unhealth. So for us moving to Charleston, uh, was, was God's timing and provision for a new season, for a new beginning. Uh, it was beautiful. You know, we, there, there are no hard feelings, but it was definitely some of the hardest years of my life. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can say things like there are no hard feelings, but it was the hardest year of my life or hardest years of my life and have freedom in the coexistence of, of what that was for me. Uh, I just recently saw an Instagram reel that like sent me over the edge. It was this woman essentially saying like, Oh, don't listen to people who talk about church hurt. Like that's offensive and divisive. And I instantly, instantly was like, Oh, this is why in quarter two of 2024, I will talk about church hurt because even the language surrounding, even the idea that it is offensive for us to talk about church hurt is so defensive of the people who are even offering up this idea Yes. Instead, it's it's like tone death too when yes. you're not giving people as pastors, as leaders, as shepherds, whether you're a minister or pastor, we're all shepherding the flock as shepherds. It is literally our job to create spaces mm-hmm. for people to heal alongside Christ. We are the vessels. And so what would it look like for me to come up to somebody and say like, ah, don't say church church. Don't do that. It's distracting. It's distracting everybody from the gospel. Instead of saying, man, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Yes. I would love to yes. walk alongside you. I'd love to hear your heart. And I'd love to show you, I'd love to show you God's heart. I'd love to show you what it yeah. looks like to heal. So I feel like I have a very unique experience in both being in a mega church and both walking alongside pastors from other churches for years. Like I, I, it is in, it is really mind blowing what God has done in my life the last 11 mm-hmm. years, truly to, to be able to step, take a step back and say, Oh, I have such a heart for churches. I have such a heart for, for lead, for team, team health and church governance. Like I, I am set on fire for those things because I've seen both like the better version and the worst version of it. Yeah. So my, my transition has been hard because you, you know, we left a a church family, strong air quotations where we were there for 10 years. And now it's kind of like, it never existed. Oh, right. Like it never happened. Like we really don't talk to anybody there. We don't really hear from anybody. And that is like wounding. It's like straight up, especially for our kids. So, you know, that, that is, that is a very real 
that's very, that's a reality for me. And so for me to try to bifurcate my experience in the name of like saving people's feelings is an honoring to God or the people that I get to walk alongside yeah. in my new church. And as I lead and write, right. And, and try to steward my platform well. So I know that may be ambiguous some, but I, I hope it gives an idea of what I've had to walk through, how the Lord's tempered my, my own uh, tongue and the way of how I've communicated it, because I do want my experience to be a bridge and really to yeah. like help better the church. And so I'm at a church now in Charleston called Bright City, been there for, it'll be almost seven months soon. And I'm taking all of my experience and all of my wisdom and I'm just laying it at the feet of, of our church and saying like, Lord, what do you, what do you have for this body? And how can I partner with yeah. you in this season? And it is the most freeing and most beautiful season that I've been in in a really long time. Mm, I'm so glad for you. I'm so Oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that, you know, being able to come through months later. And and I know, like, mm. I know that mm. it is, it is hard. And I know so that hard. you are going to grieve this again. Like, this is not one of those totally. things that, you know, like oh, you yeah. said, 11 years and family, oh my like, gosh. every time I'm sure you think you're over it, something is going to pop up or you're going to see somebody on Instagram or you're going to absolutely and say that out loud that is so true. Send you a, a yes. text for your birthday. Yeah. It just like out all of, of it. nowhere just totally. comes all the time. Totally. Yeah. You're so right. And I think, I mean, I, I talk about this a lot online is that there, it does us no good to say that those things don't hurt us, especially as leaders. Like I've seen most leaders burn out and fall fr- because of their inability to be honest with, with their wounding. And so for me to show up in the world and say like, those things don't hurt me. I've, I've moved past it. I've healed. It's, there's so much pride in that. And it's so loaded instead of offering up my humility and saying like, I can be a phenomenal leader. I can be a great Bible teacher. I can write, I can steward the lives of women and also say that was, that hurt. And it's going to yeah. take some time for me to find my footing again. Yeah. Uh, but saying it out, out loud it really disarms, I think both the enemy and my flesh from trying to find contentment and acceptance in people. Mm-hmm. Well, and just like we said at the beginning of the episode, I know we were joking about haircuts and mascara and Girl. you know, leaning into our femininity, but I think this is the same thing. Totally. Like it's, the same, it's vulnerability and it's leading yep. authentically. Yep. And as leaders and communicators, we have to be very careful. Yes, we do. About processing and the way we talk about things. Yep. But I think that's where we rely on the Holy Spirit to come in mm-hmm. and say, Hey, help me to share my experience in a way that is honoring to God, that is honoring to other people, that's but right. also is honoring to my experience yeah. and and God, what you did in my life, because you're right. If we walk through life as leaders, yeah, never talking about our hurts, never talking about the things that truly like have been painful. We are, we are blocking God reaching other people. Yeah. It's in sharing our stories that we can give them permission to feel what they're feeling totally. and the freedom to go, Hey, you didn't do anything wrong here. Like totally you can process this, you know? Yeah, Totally. Do you think there's anything looking back? And again, I know that it's a, it's a process. Um, is there anything in particular that you can see God teaching you mm. even maybe in those really hard years or in that season of transition? Oh my gosh. I think I will probably write my next like four books on all the lessons I learned. <laughs> no, for real. I like have them all in my notes. I think the two, awesome. the two lessons that I can speak, I think most boldly about that. I, that I think sort of comes out of the scope of just like leadership and within the church context is mm-hmm. learning to live from the love of God, except for, you know, and not from the love of people or for the love of yeah. people. So from the yeah. love of God, not for the love of people. And in the same breath, learning to let go, mm-hmm. learning to forgive, learning to, learning to break free from disappointment, envy, betrayal, the effects of offense. Uh, I think I got really good at picking up offenses the last 10 years. I got really good at being hypersensitive and hyper vigilant about people's rejection, people's uh, slights and learning how to be found in who I am with God, learning that my identity will never and can never be in people's yes has, has been the, the greatest lesson. And it still is such a lesson for me. It's a thorn in my side. A lot of my ministry, 
that when I show up in the world, especially when I'm talking to women, is helping us come apart or come away or from, from this idea that we have to be loved or accepted by people in order to find contentment. And so for me, mm-hmm. it was a battle of, do I actually believe that I, that I am who God says I am apart from what all these people are saying? Yeah. And it, it, it really, truly has been one of the hardest and best lessons. Yeah. But it is the game changer. Totally. That was the game changer for me too. It's that whole idea of like, is God a punisher who sees me as a sinful person? Yeah. He's always trying to catch messing up or right. does he genuinely love me? Yes. And that is where, I mean, it, it just, it changed. It does. Everything. It does change. It, it does. It changes yeah. everything. So I want to say two, I think there are two different kinds of people listening, Alex, and I want you to speak to both of them. Hmm. Um, the first person is, I think somebody who's listening, who maybe like you feels like they keep getting knocked down mm-hmm. every time they get back up again. What do you, what do you want to say to, to people listening that feel like that's their experience? Yeah. Oh man, I, I would like to probably first hug them if they, if they're into that sort of thing, (laughs) Uh, because I just know how exhausting it is to be in seasons where you just can't find your footing and you feel like you're just consistently like knocked off your feet, you know? So I would say that fighting, fighting the season you're in is just going to make it worse. Okay. I would say, have a seat exhale with God. Mm. I would say, take a step back and perceive what he's doing. Like he, there's, there's always, there's always something that God is up to. Mm -hmm. It is just for us to perceive it. Okay. And I, yeah, I think I all, I think I found myself. (laughs) So I don't know if you've never, if you're listening, have you ever, if you've ever been in the ocean and caught in a current, like when you're trying to swim, what is it towards the current? You're mm-hmm. caught in it more. You've got to swim to you've got to swim to the side. Like, do not try mm-hmm. to go right into the current because it's just going to turn you over. Go to the side. Take a seat with God and perceive what He's up to. <laughs> I love that. I did not expect you to say like, "Hey, just sit down and deal with it." But it's straight true. up. You have, you to. have to. There is you no way. To. There's like no hyper spiritual. Like I, there is no way to get through hard seasons with God other than sitting down with God. Like I. Yeah coming from like a performer, a striver, like here are four things that I want you to do when you're getting knocked down on your, on your butt, right? Like that's, there isn't there. Yeah. What you do is you sit down with God, you abide, yeah. right? You take what's really called yeah. abiding, right? Like not to throw a Christianese yeah. word, it's abiding. What I'm asking you to do is to sit and abide, to be with Jesus, to yeah. sit with God and let him tend to your soul because you're tired. Like, what mm-hmm. are you going to do? You're exhausted. You're going to go back out and fight. Mm-hmm. Like it's not your fight to mm-hmm. fight. It's not your battle, right? So just have a seat. Yeah. And there's no way we can get through it without acknowledging and letting ourselves feel our feelings right. either. I think that's a yeah. lot of the fight is like, I'm just going to muscle my way through, yeah. but you got to sit with it all. You got to sit and process those emotions that God actually gave us so that we can process yeah, things. Absolutely. All right. Well, on the flip side, I think a lot of times too, there are people, and I know that this has been my you know narrative that I clung to for a while that are like, well, nothing nothing like this has happened to me. I don't have this big turning uh, point moment. Yes. I don't have this Real, big it's a Damascus story. story. Right. And so for people listening who maybe they're lucky enough to not have had anything yeah. like a major setback, yeah. maybe they feel like they have nothing to share. What encouragement can you give them? I, this might be like some of my favorite people to talk to. Uh, because, okay. because I remember a young I, years ago when I first started speaking, this a young girl came up to me at a youth conference and she was like, I feel like I don't have a testimony to share because I grew up in the church. Yep. Like my life has been, I've been so blessed and mm-hmm. I feel like there isn't anything unique about me. And yeah. I remember looking at her and being so burdened by her inability to see God's grace over her life. Mm. And I looked at her and I said, something along the lines of, I need to hear the testimony of how God has been faithful in your family Mm. and how you are here today. And so I would say that to our friends who are listening, like people need to know that there is steadfastness, that there are people who have known God. You guys are like the heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11, like by faith, right? Like by faith, Kristen has been gotten here by faith, by faith. And so by faith, you have known God. You have gotten to know God. I used to be so envious of people who've had a relationship with God longer than me. Seriously. I used to be like, y'all grew up 
knowing God, like that's incredible. You know, back <laughs> at the ranch, like, hello. I right. was like, I would say you have such an important story and unique vantage point where you get to say, I've known God and in my seasons. And here's the thing that's, that's true too, right? I think a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pride in both because we, we think that it's really centered around our experience and really it's just about God's grace. So when we pull mm-hmm. ourselves back out of it too, it's really less about our stories and more so about the grace of God and the fact mm. that we just get to be called his, right? So yeah. I would say, know that your story is unique. You've known God, you know, God, there's something that you have that I don't, that I've, that's not mm. mine to share. I don't get to say that you get to, to talk and teach and, and minister from such a different vantage point. You have a beautiful story and it doesn't have to be this road to Damascus experience where people are like, wow, I didn't know you were, you, you know, you got saved off a cliff when you were five and God, you know, like lifted you up. Have y'all seen, this is, this is probably going to get me in trouble. Have y'all seen the, um, this is how I see it in my head, the 50 cent meme where the, the, the song, the clip that goes, he's like a fairy. Oh yeah. Have you seen that at all? Yeah. Okay. I think that people who, <laughs> I think that people who say like, well, I don't have a story to share are expecting others to look at them like that, like a fairy that are floating, like a fairy uh-huh, that's floating. Uh-huh. And in reality, like no one wants to see that, even though it's it looks cute. I just want you to tell me you've known God for a really long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. I love that. We're gonna have to find that and link it up mm-hmm. for people that don't know what we're talking about. It's so funny. Listen, this is how it works. We see God everywhere. We see the Holy totally. Spirit. Totally. Right. I you you said something just now, Alex, that I would bet that people who grew up in the church, yeah. people who have quote unquote known God their whole lives would have this commonality where basically you said we have to pull ourselves out. Like we're centering ourselves when we have that perception. That's how I received it. At least what you said. And I think that it's really good and true actually, because I think those of us that did grow up in the church yeah. and grew up with God also maybe had a little bit of messaging that it was about us. Yeah. Jesus came for me. And like just some of the language and the way things were presented, I think it can be hard for us sometimes to see that we are part of a bigger story. And yes, it's a personal relationship, but Jesus came for us as a collective. Like he didn't just die for Kristen. And so, Mm. you know, being able to say my experience Hmm. is more about what God has done in my life than like the choices I made. Totally. I think that that is, well, I, I, mind blowing. it is mind blowing. And that's just like an, a very like Americanized gospel. Yeah. Right. Like I, yeah. that, that is that like, this is what God has done for me versus this is what God has done for his family. Like the communal language mm-hmm. around the gospel. Yeah. I think that the, the difference between those who understand grace and those of us who don't is that those of us who do understand grace, understand that it's actually by faith through grace or by, by grace through faith that we get to be called God's sons and daughters, that it, there is no yeah. perform, like it's not performative. It's not even about mm-hmm. behavior modification. And those of us who don't right. understand grace think that it is because of our unique testimony. So like the greater the testimony, the more the favor of God, where th- that, that is so legalistic and so performative right. that it right. takes away the need for a savior. Like why would we need a savior if we can work mm-hmm. ourselves to more favor, more love, more grace. Grace abounds because of the cross, right? So like, yeah. there isn't a, well, my story and God, this, God did this for me. Here's how I explain it. Because of God's grace, we get to have our own unique story where we can point back to how God has saved us all, mm-hmm. right? So like, I see it's a masterpiece. Like Ephes- I think it's Ephesians that talks about being a workmanship, Ephesians 2.10 that we are all God's workmanship and there are pieces to this mosaic that go together. See what I did there. And each piece Mm -hmm. of the mosaic plays (laughs) a a small part in God's greater story. So each of you who are listening are playing a huge part in God's story. And whether you love your story or not, we don't get to choose our assignment. We just get to show up how we go into it. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Alex. So as these puzzle pieces, as these mosaic pieces, love what you did there. Thank you. It was not lost on me. Thank you. And since the podcast is called Becoming Church, mm-hmm. right? We're going to meld these two ideas together. How can people that are listening become the church to the people around them? How can mm-hmm. they play their part well? 
I love that. That is such a beautiful question that takes us out of looking inward and Mm -hmm. really points us to what it means to live a life on mission. I would say that every single one of us, we are the, we are, we are the church. Like we are the dwelling place of the living God. We are the temple. And what I love about that is that that means that wherever we go, we get to shine the actual light of Jesus in our lives and through our lives. So one way to do that really, really well is by noticing where God has you. It is one of the best ways I think, and I believe, and Paul tells us this in Philippians, to fight discontentment, you must be hyper aware of the assignment God's given you so that you Mm. can show up fully where you are to give them everything God's given you to give them. So you you get to be the church and build a church as you are becoming more like Christ Jesus. It's this, it's this, it's called sanctification, big word for we're all, we're all transforming. It's all happening at the same time, but we still get to live on mission. So go be set free, show the people around you, the people you don't like, I'm going to go there, right? The people that have betrayed you, the people that you may Mm -hmm. not like in your family, your neighbors, Mm -hmm. they're yours for a reason. (laughs) They're not mine. (laughs) I have my own, right? I got my own lot. I got my yeah. own field of steward. They're yours. So I want to challenge you and call you up and say, a lot of the time in our lives, we struggle with discontentment because we're really wrestling through complacency. So like our complacency to live a passive life and a passive faith, most, most of the time will get us to discontentment, but becoming the church and living on mission means we get to show up and say, all right, God, where do you have me? What do you have for me? And how can I, how can I be everything you've called me to be for your glory and my good? And the good of others. Exactly how you made me leaning into all of my weird, yeah. quirky, my 50 things. cent analogies, <laughs> whatever, and floating like a fairy. <laughs> yes. 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 I'm not ashamed. Yes. No, nor should you nope. be, nor should you be. All right, Alex, thank you so much. Before I let you go, yeah. you have an exciting announcement. Yes. Next thing, next week, you have something launching. Tell us what it is. Yeah. So speaking about becoming the church and discontentment and living on mission, next week I launch uh, my very first course. It's called Calling Academy. Yay. It is the calling course, uh, different from all the courses you've ever seen, but the one you actually need. That is our, Love. yes, that's the tagline. Uh, it's for women who are looking to break free from discontentment and start living fully where they are with God. So uh, the heart of it is, I feel like our entire generation uh, has fought for either platform success and purpose through striving and we're all burnt out. And now we're trying to figure mm-hmm. out how to get back to what calling is. And so it's six weeks of finding our true calling and experiencing God in that. Awesome. So will that be like Zoom calls with you? Yeah. Will that be videos? Yeah, so it'll be study? six. So it'll be six Zoom calls with me. Uh, you will get one hour of coaching when you buy the course with me post six weeks, which I think is really cool to give the women practical next steps for their own specific journey. The caveat yeah. is I'm only I'm only taking 35 women. Okay. So that's that is the caveat. The caveat is we're we're praying for 35 and we can only take 35 because I just think I wouldn't be able to walk alongside more than 35 yeah. to 40 well, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. so that, that's it. I'm, ex- I'm excited Yay. and expectant and really hope to see just women come alive where they are uh, with their own unique assignments for God. Well, listen, you are a woman that I would follow to the ends of the earth. I'm so proud Thank of you. you I'm so just grateful for your voice and your life and your ministry Thank and you. your leadership. And so we're going to drop the link below. Woo. Ladies, run, run, <laughs> go sign up for this. I have zero doubt mm. that it's going to be anything but phenomenal. Thank you, friend. Changing. So thank you so much. Thanks. You have a story to tell because you are part of God's greatest story, which includes all of us. So tell it in a small group, maybe one-on-one with a friend for coffee, possibly writing in a blog or just one social media post. My hope is that you will begin to see God moving all over your life and that you would tell other people about it so they can then begin to see him in theirs. Please help us grow this ministry and get the word out about our podcast by leaving a review. Remember, you only have until March 10th to be entered to win that Amazon gift card. 
Not only will it help us, but you never know who your review or your words will reach when someone else finds them. Thank you for listening, for supporting us, and for committing to grow even when it's challenging. Go write that review and then keep becoming church to the people around you.